Welcome to Tel Aviv, Israel. I'm walking down Rothschild Boulevard, which was one of the first streets to be built in this city when it was founded in 1909. Across the street behind me is a very historic building. It was the home of the first mayor of Tel Aviv, Meyer Diesengoff. In 1930, after he died, his wife donated the home to the city of Tel Aviv and it became an art museum. It was in this building that the Provisional Government of Israel met on May the 14th, 1948 to proclaim the independence of the State of Israel. Here's a photograph that was taken that historic day showing a large crowd standing outside the building. In Proverbs 21.1, it says that the hearts of the world's political leaders are like channels of water in the hand of God and that He can turn them in any direction He desires. The events leading up to the Israeli Declaration of Independence are a good example of this truth that God has the wisdom and the power to orchestrate world events to the triumph of His will. Let's begin with the British. As a result of World War I, they were entrusted with Palestine as a League of Nations mandate. They immediately issued the Balfour Declaration in which they promised to prepare the way for the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine. That declaration alone was a momentous event and no one knows for sure why they issued it. Some historians believe it was because a Jewish scientist named Heim Weizmann had developed a synthetic form of acetone during the war which was essential for the production of cordite explosive. Others believe it was because most of the British leaders were evangelical Christians who believed the Bible prophecies concerning the Jews. Now after World War II, the British got caught in the crossfire between the Jews and the Arabs as each tried to gain control of Palestine. As British troop casualties rose, public opinion began to demand a British withdrawal. The British Prime Minister, Clement Attlee, finally decided to ask the United Nations to intervene, but he did so believing that they would not take him up on the offer. One reason Attlee was confident the United Nations would not take action was because of the Russian attitude toward Palestine. You see, the Russians were staunch allies of the Arabs and they had made it clear that they would never stand for the creation of a Jewish state. But to everyone's astonishment, the Russian Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko suddenly announced that the Russia was going to support the establishment of a Jewish state. To this day, no one knows why the Russians made this about face, particularly when you consider the fact that it enraged their Arab allies. The best guess that I have run across so far is that the Russians decided it was a good way to force the British out of the Middle East. And although it would result in the establishment of a Jewish state, they believed the state would be quickly overthrown by the Arabs and they, the Russians, would be able to fill the power vacuum. So on November the 29th, 1947, the United Nations voted to allow the creation of a Jewish state. The United States supported that resolution. The British immediately announced that they would withdraw from Palestine on May 15th of the following year. You know, the rapid pace of these events had caught everyone off guard, including officials within the Truman administration. In the winter of 1947-1948, those within the administration who opposed the creation of a Jewish state began to pressure the president. This included the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Defense Department, and most important of all, the State Department. All began to argue that it would be a diplomatic disaster for the United States to continue with its support of the creation of a Jewish state. They argued that it would jeopardize our access to Arab oil. The leader of this opposition was Secretary of State General George C. Marshall, the man whom President Truman admired the most. Marshall started pushing for Palestine to be put under a United Nations trusteeship. The man, of course, who would make the final decision was President Truman, and he had been uniquely prepared for the decision by the Lord. First, he had always been a voluminous reader and was thus thoroughly familiar with Jewish history and their rightful claim to this land. Second. He had been raised in the Baptist church and was thoroughly familiar with the Bible and the spiritual claim of the Jews that they have on this land. Third, his best friend throughout his lifetime had been a Jew by the name of Eddie Jacobson. The two of them owned a clothing store before Truman entered politics and throughout his political career, the two remained the closest of friends. Fourth, Truman's closest advisor as president was a man named Clark Clifford and Mr. Clifford was a strong supporter of Israeli independence. But folks, the problem was that Clifford was the only person in the Truman administration who favored the creation of the Jewish state. On May the 12th, two days before the British deadline, Marshall and his staff met with the president and his staff. And when Clark Clifford presented a strong historical and biblical case for recognition of Israel, 
General Marshall became so enraged that he proclaimed, Mr. President, if you recognize Israel, I will vote for your opponent in the November election. <laughs> Needless to say, every person present, including the president, was stunned. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, the president's old pal, Eddie Jacobson, decided to take action. He went to Washington, D.C. and met with Truman. And he told the president, I have never asked anything of you since you became president, but I'm going to do so now. I believe that when you were in your father's loins, God ordained you for this moment. He then strongly urged the president to recognize Israel when the Declaration of Independence was read. Well, as you can see, the pressure on Truman from all sides was overwhelming. At one point, he wrote an aide, I surely wish God Almighty would give the children of Israel and Isaiah, the Christians of St. Paul, and the sons of Ishmael a peep at the Golden Rule. That was the situation in the United States when May 14, 1948 arrived. Let's go inside the hall. It was in this small room that the Declaration of Independence was read. The room could accommodate hardly 200 people. The provisional government sat here. David Ben-Gurion stood up here in front of the central microphone underneath the picture of Theodore Herzl and read the Declaration of Independence. I'm going to ask one of my colleagues, Don McGee, to join us now and to stand where David Ben-Gurion stood and read some sections of the Declaration of Independence. Don, it's all yours. The land of Israel was the birthplace of the Jewish people. Here their spiritual, religious, and political identity was shaped. Here they first attained to statehood, created cultural values of national and universal significance, and gave to the world the eternal book of books. After being forcibly exiled from their land, the people kept faith with it throughout their dispersion and never ceased to pray and hope for their return to it and for the restoration in it of their political freedom. Impelled by this historic and traditional attachment, Jews strove in every successive generation to reestablish themselves in their ancient homeland. In recent decades, they returned in their masses. As pioneers, they made deserts bloom, revived the Hebrew language, built villages and towns, and created a thriving community aspiring towards independent nationhood. It is the natural right of the Jewish people to be masters of their own fate, like all other nations, in their own sovereign state. Accordingly, we, members of the People's Council, representatives of the Jewish community of the land of Israel and of the Zionist movement, are here assembled on the day of the termination of the British mandate over the land of Israel, and by virtue of our natural and historic right, and on the strength of the resolution of the United Nations General Assembly, hereby declare the establishment of a Jewish state in the land of Israel to be known as the State of Israel. Placing our trust in the Rock of Israel, we affix our signatures to this proclamation at this session of the Provisional Council of State on the soil of the homeland in the city of Tel Aviv on this Sabbath Eve, the fifth day of E.R. 5708. Thank you, Don. Well, folks, 11 minutes after the Declaration of Independence became official at midnight that day, President Truman went against the counsel of all of his advisors and issued a statement recognizing the new state. The next morning, Five Arab nations attacked Israel, and the War of Independence began. President Truman proceeded into the presidential election of 1948 with no hope of winning. His popularity rating was at an all-time low, and his opponent, Governor Dew of New York, was an articulate candidate who was well-organized and well-financed. And the president's party was split three ways. Strom Thurmond was heading up the racist element as the candidate of the Dixiecrats, and former Vice President Henry Wallace was heading up the Socialist Wing as the candidate of the Progressive Party. On Election Day, many newspapers went ahead and printed headlines proclaiming Dewey's victory. But incredibly, Truman was re-elected. How can that be explained? I can think of only one explanation. The Bible says that God will bless those who bless Israel, and He will curse those who curse Israel. President Truman had been a blessing to Israel, and God returned the blessing to him. 